Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series is proving to be a very fascinating one on church doctrines. And the first church doctrine we're really focusing on is what happens to a person when they die? It's entitled Everlasting Life on Death, Dying, and the Future Hope. And this is lesson number four in that series called The Old Testament Hope. It's a lesson for October 22 of 2022. And some of you will remember that that was a formidable date, a very special date uh, back in 1844. This was supposed to be the day when Jesus arrived. So you can think about that and maybe do a little reviewing of the history. But as usual, we like to begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, what a privilege it is to come together and discuss these very important issues and see if we can better understand your plans for us and for the universe. May we uh, clearly understand what is before us today is our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. This lesson will try to focus on the Old Testament and see how it clearly supports the idea that at death people sleep in the grave and then arise at the resurrection. The righteous arise at the second coming, the wicked arise at the third coming. If you, we won't, we'll get into that more in future lessons, but that's just a little bit of a hint. Jim? From the Bible study guide, the Old Testament hope is grounded not in, on Greek ideas that the natural immortality of the soul, but on the biblical teaching of the final resurrection of the dead. But how could a no longer existent human body cremated into ashes or destroyed by other means be brought to life again? How can someone who has been deceased, perhaps for centuries or even millennia, recover again his or her identity? From the Bible Study Guide for October 15. That certainly is the question that some people would ask. I mean, how, I mean, obviously we know that ancient peoples always left them as bones. And in many cases, I mean, the ones who died at sea, there's not even any bones left. So, well, the best example I can think of to try to make this understandable to modern day humans is when we get a new computer. And if you have a lot of things on your computer like I do, then you know that that new computer sits there it's all new hardware, it's better and it's faster and it's shiny and all that kind of stuff. But what's important is what's inside there. And what, is it, what do we call that stuff that's inside there? We call that the software. Well, what happens, God can, the first question is, can God create new bodies? Of course he can create new bodies. But where is the software kept? That's the part, and, you know, our brains have software, I mean, it's not, same as the stuff that goes in the computers. It's a much more sophisticated software, but God has all that completely recorded. So when your new body comes along, God can simply install that old software and it's you just like you were brand new, only better and faster. So it's not just the software that he installs, but all the data that's, yes. that, that we have stored up. All our pictures, all our videos, all our documents. Okay, all the, all the memory stuff, right? Yep. By comparison, God has obviously demonstrated his ability to create human beings. He has a complete and detailed account of everything we have ever done, thought, seen, heard. That software, if I can call it software, can be installed in a new body, creating a new person with all the same characteristics that she or he had in the former life. Of course, without the disabilities, the limbs missing, or the pieces missing, or whatever, th that will not be true. <clears throat> Only, of course, now it's a much better new body. It is clear that God can create human beings, as demonstrated in Genesis 1, that we're all familiar with, and Psalms 36, 6 and 9, where it says clearly, um, your righteousness is t towering over the mountains. I'm sorry. Your justice is like the depths I'm sorry, we've got... I think it's 
Psalms 33, 6 and 9. 33, 6 and 9. By the I'm words sorry. Of, the mouth, of, of the Lord, what the heavens made. And all the hosts of the, by the breath of his mouth. Yes, sorry. Go to Adventist schools, you know. Yeah, okay. So uh, <clears throat> our focus is, in this lesson will be on statements made by Job, Isaiah, and Daniel. Job was one of the very first inspired books ever written for scripture. Job and Genesis were both written by Moses while he was herding sheep in Midian. The long years spent amid desert solitudes were not lost. Not only was Moses gaining a preparation for the great work before him, but during the time under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he, that is Moses, wrote the book of Genesis and also the book of Job. This is from the writings of Ellen White which would be read with the deepest interest by the people of God until the close of time. That's from Ellen White, Signs of the Times, February 19, 1880, paragraph 14. And it also, also can be found in volume three of the SDA Bible Commentary. So now, a question. In the past, we've talked about the earliest alphabetic writing. How was it invented, and by whom, do you know? Probably Moses. Well, no, right. probably not. Although, uh, we don't know. The, the right answer is we don't know for sure. A very scholarly uh, person who studied this in great depth suggests that he thinks it was Joseph. He says, Joseph came from speaking Hebrew in, in basically Palestine, came down to Egypt, and he realized, okay, these people know how to write things, how can we write things in our language in a way that ordinary common people can read? And he thinks that Joseph was one who might have been the first one to invent an alphabet. That's a guess. That's obviously a guess. But when did Moses learn to write? Probably during his years Young with years. the princess, training when he was training anyway. to be a, yeah. uh, the next king. Training to be the next king, almost certainly. So. On what was he riding out there when he was herding sheep? You thought about that? No papyrus there. No papyrus out there. Maybe sheepskin. <laughs> now, they might have maybe sheepskins, but they, unless they had some very unusual ways to, I mean, the sheepskin that they later used for riding on was from unborn sheep. Very, very thin. And so that's why it would, it, you, it would preserve, be preserved and still be, could be treated and was soft enough. If you tried to ride on regular sheepskin, especially without being cured properly, it would be useless. So these are questions. And how were these books preserved? Did, after he wrote them, did Moses carry them back under his arm when, his, when he went back to Egypt? Maybe Moses wrote them in his brain. Maybe he wrote them in his brain. And, and, later, and later transcribed them. Well, I, that's possible, I suppose. Well, Job had some things. We're focusing, of course, on death and what happens there. Job had some very significant things to say about death and how it might have impacted him. Uh, Charles? But I know there is someone in heaven who will come at last to my defense. Even after my skin is eaten by disease, while still in this body, I will see God. I will see him with my own eyes and he will not be a stranger. Okay, once again, we have to admit, we have no idea where Job lived. Now, that's not completely true. While Uz cannot definitely be identified with any known locality, it seems to have lain near the Syrian desert or possibly north, northern Arabia and not far from Edom because those places are mentioned. So somewhere there, um, maybe in northwestern Arabia. How do you think Moses learned about Job? Did he learn about Job from his father-in-law? Do we know that, Mo that Lo Job lived before Moses? Maybe they talked. Maybe they talked. After, maybe after the whole thing had happened. But that wouldn't no. Very little in our world of sin and death is fair. A perfect, because we're going to talk more about that in a little bit. I'm not giving up on it. 
A perfect example of that is the story of Job. Job played a very important role in the great controversy. Jim? Life is not fair. We see, especially when we see the quotes good suffering and the unright quotes unrighteous prospering, see Psalm 73, 12 to 17, and Malachi 3, 14 to, excuse me, 14 to 18. For example, Job was blameless and upright and feared God and shunned evil, Job 1, 1, from the New King James, Ver New King James Version. Even so, God allowed Satan to afflict him in several disastrous ways. Physically, his body was ravaged by painful disease, Job 2, chapter 2, verses 1 to 8. Materially, he lost large portions of the, his livestock and properties. Job chapter 1, verses 13 to, to 17. Within his household, he lost his servants and even his own children. Job chapter 1, verses 16 and 18. And emotionally, he was surrounded by friends who accused him of being an impenitent sinner who deserved what he was facing. Job chapter 4, verses 1 to 5 and no, Job me, four, verses one. 1, to f 1 to chapter 5, verse 27. Correct. Job 8, verses 1 to 22. Job 11, verses 1 to 20, etc. And we're going to see a little bit more of that. Man, the stuff they accused him of is just... Go Even ahead. his own wife stated, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. Job <laughs> chapter 2, verse 9 of the New King James Version. From This from the Bible Study Guide for October 16. When Job gets to heaven, here we go, some more questions to think about. When Job gets to heaven, what will God say to him? Welcome. Will God apologize to Job? God will say, you said of me what was right. Yeah, there you are. Beautifully put together. Will he thank Job? Yes. What will God say to Job's first family who were destroyed at the beginning of the story? The story that we have. Glad to see you. I'm sorry that you, that it ended so quickly for you, but welcome. You think those children will be in heaven? Apparently they had a saintly father, didn't they? Yeah. Doesn't mean they're saintly. No. Well, they were at a party of the oldest son. But yeah. the biggest thing is, uh, to me, the Lord will say, Job, I trusted you. In you, I could have lost my credibility all mm -hmm. over the universe. Mm -hmm. And I guess he's the only one to me in the Old Testament yeah. that, that stands true. Well, Job's family, the first family, will they wonder, they want to hear what in the world it was all about, what was happening? I mean, they, what happened to them happened so fast that they hardly had a chance to even think about it. That, the book we've had there, the book of Job, has had the long, well, but the longest history about the character of God. Mm -hmm. The book of Job, the oldest yep. book that most everybody has access to if they, if they want to. And it tells you, it, it does it kind of in a backhanded way, doesn't yeah. it? It doesn't, it doesn't spell out, these are the lies. No, it says, you're not telling the truth. So you gotta go through and sort out what were these guys selling? And I compared them with the, the words that Job had said, mm -hmm. and uh, <laughs> a lot, much, much majority of what they said was great. I and mean, you have no, no disagreement. But all the things that stick out is God punishes and God destroys, and that is probably what uh, was addressed. And you're it, being punished less than you deserve. Deserve, oh yeah. And your children. Yeah. Okay. The psalmist also wrote about the unfairness of life. Carrie, Carrie you want to take that one? Yeah. Um, speaking of Psalm 73, verses 12 to 17. That is what the wicked are like. They have plenty and are always getting more. It is for nothing then that I have kept myself pure and have not committed sin. O oh God, you have made me suffer all day long Every morning you have punished me. I have said such things. I would not be acting as one of your people. I tried to think this problem through, but it was too difficult for me until I went into your temple. 
Then I understood what will happen to the wicked. This is from the Good News Bible. Okay, what temple did David go into? Is this David? I, I actually, I guess we're not sure that it was written by David. If it was David, he went into the tent. Tent. But he wasn't supposed to be doing that. Well, he went but he did. adjacent to the tent. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well. Into the courtyard, maybe? It is only in the context of a clear understanding of the great controversy that many of these problems can be understood. Do we clearly understand how the great controversy could affect us? Can we explain the great controversy to a friend so as to make it clear in their understanding? There's no, you can't put it into a small package. No. I mean, you got to start Takes a out while. with the book of Job and, and for, for get-go and uh, it may take many sessions. Yeah. For one, I think we need to say it's the great controversy between God and Satan. And what's it about? It's over the character and government of God, how yeah. God deals with sinners. Rebellion. Yeah, yeah. including Satan himself. And yeah. can you think of any other Christian persuasion that addresses that issue or has it no. as part of their, their uh, understanding? No. No, it doesn't exist. It's, a, oh, oh, it's all over the issue the, of the character and government of God, and you uh, can't find it. Let's see if we can see that illustrated in some passages from Job now. Job 1.1. 1, 1. Uh, from Good News Bible, Job 1.1. 1, 1. There was a man named Job living in the land of Uz who worshipped God and was faithful to him. He was a good man, careful not to do anything evil. Careful not to do anything evil. That's a pretty incredible comment. Go ahead. And later in verses 13 to 18, one day when Job's children were having a feast at the home of their oldest brother, a messenger came rush, running to Job. We were plowing the fields with the oxen, he said, and the donkeys were in a nearby pasture. Suddenly the Sabaeans attacked and stole them all. They killed every one of your servants except me. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. Before he had finished speaking, another servant came and said, Lightning struck the sheep and the shepherds and killed them all. I am the only one who escaped from that group to tell you. Before he had finished speaking, another servant came and said, Three bands of Chaldean raiders, that's the Babylonians, right? Mm -hmm. The, Bab the Chaldean raiders attacked us, took away the camels, and killed all your servants except me. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. I might make a little correction. The Chaldeans would be the, uh, the ancestors of the Babylonians. Okay. Yes. Before he had finished speaking, another servant came and said, Your children were having a feast at the home of your oldest son. When a storm swept in from the desert, it blew the house down and killed them all. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. Wow. Good news, Bible. Is that good news? Well, it's, it, it's an accurate report of what happened, I think. Job 2, 1 through 8. When the day came for the heavenly beings to appear before the Lord again, Satan was among them. The Lord asked him, Where have you been? Satan answered, I have been walking here and there, roaming round the earth. <clears throat> Did you notice my servant Job, the Lord asked. There is no one on earth as faithful and good as he is. He worships me and is careful not to do anything evil. You persuaded me to let you attack him for no reason at all. But Job is still as faithful as ever. Satan replied, a person will give up everything in order to stay alive. But now suppose you hurt his body, he will curse you to your face. So the Lord said to Satan, All right, he is in your power, but you are not to kill him. Then Satan left the Lord's presence and made sores break out all over Job's body. Job went and sat by the rubbish heap and took a piece of broken pottery to scrape his sores. Okay, what would a Satan sore look like? Maybe like monkeypox? <laughs> Job's problem was living a perfect life, or near perfect life. That's a terrible sin, right? That really annoyed Satan. So we have the story of, the Job, of Job preserved for us. Try to imagine how excited God was to have someone like Job to whom he could point. 
Would you treat your best friend the way God treated Job? Why did God choose to allow Satan to do that? Well, you're all going to give me an answer, right? <laughs> Why do you suppose God allowed that? To demonstrate what Lucifer was like, what Satan was like. Well, this was part, this was a sort of an opening salvo and the great controversy on this earth. And God says, here someone can illustrate a point that is very important to be made. In fact, a point that many, very, very few from that day until this have really understood. But he needed to be made, so, so God said, okay, um, I'm, willing to, I'm willing to allow Satan to do this. So how did Job develop the character that allowed him to be like that? Yeah. We're going to talk more about that in a moment, so hold on. from a family of priests and... Nope. He and Joseph were friends at different times. <laughs> <laughs> well, Job frequently admitted that he... Now, this is one thing we know clearly. While Job frequently admitted that he did not know why all those things were happening to him, he admitted his ignorance. His friends thought that they knew the answer to everything. Notice these very incredible words from Eliphaz, the leader of the group. Job 4, 7 through 19. Think back now. Name a single case where a righteous person met with disaster. So what are the implications there? If you're meeting, if this kind of terrible disaster is happening to you, that means you are what? You're the sinner. A the terrible sinner. At Jesus' time, he's your own yep. disciples. Yep. His own disciples. Whose sin is this Clearly one? Really, you are not righteous. Yeah. It's obvious. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen people plow fields of evil and sow the wickedness like seed. Now they harvest wickedness as evil. Like a storm, God destroys them in his anger. The wicked roar and growl like lions, but God silences them and breaks their teeth. We have to remember who's saying this. this yes. Is yeah. This is one of Job's enemies speaking for the devil himself. Yeah. Go ahead. And God later said, you didn't say what's right. Only Job said what's right. Well, watch, watch this, what's coming up. Like lions with nothing to kill and eat, they die and all their children are scattered. Once a message came quietly, so quietly I could hardly hear it. Like a nightmare, I... It disturbed my sleep. I trembled and shuddered. My whole body shook with fear. A light breeze touched my face and my hair bristled with fright. I could see something standing here, there. I stared but couldn't tell what it was. Then I heard a voice out of the silence. Can anyone be righteous in the sight of God or be pure before his creator? Okay, I'm going to interrupt here for a second. What do we, we've already read twice that God said, what about Job? Righteous and upright man. Righteous and upright man. So what's happening here? Satan is directly trying to contradict God's words. Have we ever heard that happen before? <laughs> is, this, is this passage in the um, Bible study guide? No, not this one. Because I, I'd be interested. Well, part of it is yeah. to follow that because here they are quoting passages from the from the li for lying friends of Job, quoting them as if they were memory verses. And I first learned that from your wife. Yes. At least twenty five years ago. Yeah. And uh, when she says, "Since when do we quote as a memory verse the words of an apparition?" <laughs> and man, I am really slow. I finally, uh, a few up. years ago, f figured, going to, what were those lies about? But yeah. here, it, it, mm -hmm. and I con consulted at least 30, I think it's 36 Bible commentaries, excuse me, study Bibles, and about 17 or 18 Bible commentaries. Mm -hmm. None of them addressed the issue, what were the lies on the f part of the Friends of Job? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. interruptions, go ahead. Eight. God does not trust his heavenly servants. 
he finds fault even with his angels. <laughs> Guess a, another direct right. accusation against God. Go ahead. Just like in the garden. Mm -hmm. Do you think he will trust a creature of clay? A thing of dust that can be crushed like a moth? You know, I just cannot help it. Here is a man who is really, truly hurting, and he could be questioning his creator. Yeah. But he would not. No. How beautiful. Notice that these words, we only just want to emphasize this, verses 17 and 19 came directly from Satan or one of his angels and were a direct contradiction to what God had said about Job. Hmm. And as Jim has already mentioned some years ago, Job 4, 17 was actually used as a memory verse for a Bible, one of our Bible study lessons. Look carefully what this, the passage we've just read. Where did this message come from? Clearly it was from Satan, one of his angels, yet many have quoted it as coming directly from God. Eliphaz concluded by saying, let's, let's just look at their emphasis on what they specifically said. Job 5, 27, Eliphaz said, Job, we have learned this by a long study, it is true, so now accept it. So one of the arguments that people give is, this has always been true. You know, so here's, there, he's used that argument. This is Job, settled truth. Settled truth, right. Job 8, 4, Bildad said, your children must have sinned against God, so he punished them as they deserved. Job 5, 6 and 7, evil does not grow in the soil, nor does trouble grow out of the ground. No, indeed, people bring trouble on themselves, as surely as sparks fly up from a fire. So in other words, Job, if you're having trouble, where does it come from? You're a guilty sinner, Job. And Zophar gave his conclusion, verse, chapter 11, verse 6, he would tell you there are many sides to wisdom. There are things too deep for human knowledge. God is punishing you less than you deserve. So every one of his friends basically came with that kind of accusation. Even Job's wife had a similar conclusion. His wife said to him, you are still as faithful as ever, aren't you? Why don't you curse God and die? So we do not know if Job ever knew about what we read in Job 1 and 2. There's no evidence that, you know, directly stating in anywhere in Job or any other references back to Job suggesting that Job ever found out what happened and why. How differently do you think the discussions would have been between Job and his friends if they had all heard Job 1 and 2 before their discussion started? <laughs> We, would, we might not even have the book of Job. It might have flowed right over their heads, as we say. Mm. I suppose that's possible. Their, yeah. their paradigm might have been so Surely, stressed. Surely, at least Job would have referred back to it and said, hold on just a minute, don't you remember how all this started? It's amazing that Job could say what he did considering his circumstances. He had lost everything, his family, his health, his wealth, the trust of his friends, and he still trusted God. Job did not have a pastor, a prophet to guide him, no Bible had yet been written, a Sabbath school class or church group or discussion group with whom he to meet and study. His only discussion group was the four friends we know about who were all wrong. How did Job develop the faith and trust in God that he had? Did God meet with him on several occasions as he did with Moses? How can we learn to trust God the way Job did? Do we meet with God? Mm -hmm. That's what we do here, right? Well, hopefully other times too. Yes. We need to remember that Satan is alive and well on planet Earth. He would destroy every faithful believer in God if he could. He would claim this Earth as his own, his own domain, but sin would eventually destroy itself. So now we turn to the Psalms. Jim, I think it's your turn. So from the Bible study guide, Psalms 49 speaks about the false confidence of the foolish, quotes, who trust in their wealth and boast in, their, in the multitude of their riches. Psalms 49, verse six, New King James Version. Who call their lands after their own names, Psalms 49, 11, and who live only to bless themselves, Psalms 49, 18. They act as if their houses and their own glory would last forever, Psalms 49, verses 11 and 17. 
but the foolish forget that their honor vanishes and that they perish just as the beast. Psalms 49 verse 12. Like sheep, they are laid in the grave. Death shall feed on them and their beauty shall be consumed in the grave far from their dwelling. Psalms 49, 14. Well, hopefully at least they're not going to be eaten the way the sheep are eaten. <laughs> Remember the, the Jezebel when they threw her over the, over the wall yes. and, then, and then the dogs Eat. ate of her and there's no trace of her. Yep. Okay. As stated by Job centuries earlier, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I will depart. Job chapter 1, verse 21, the NIV, First uh, Timothy 6, verse 7. We'll look at that in a moment. The psalmist points out that both the fool and the wise die, leaving their wealth to others. Psalms 49.10, with the New King James Version. This is from the Bible Study Guide for October 17. First, first, yeah, go ahead. First Timothy 6, verse 7. What did we, excuse me, what did we bring into the world? Nothing. What can we take away out of the world? Nothing. This is from the Good News Bible. The Bible Study Guide says, but there are there is a radical contrast between them. That is between the fools and the righteous. Right. On one side are the fools who perish, even though that, though trying to find assurance in their own transient possessions and accomplishments. In contrast, the wise behold beyond human saga and the prison of the grave, the glorious reward that God has reserved for them. First Peter 1, verse 4 from the Bible Study Guide for October 17. First Peter 1, 4. And so we look forward to possessing rich blessings that God keeps for his people. He keeps them for you in heaven where they cannot decay or spoil or fade away from the Good News Bible. Psalms 49, 15, God, but God will rescue me. He will save me from the power of death from the Good News Bible. Okay, a lot of repeating ideas there. Nothing we can do or say in this life will preserve us for the life to come. It is only through the plan of salvation made secure by Jesus Christ. That is our only hope. Riches cannot save us. Position cannot save us. Fame cannot save us. All sorts of claims are made by the so-called important people on this earth. Some will claim fame. Some will claim riches. Others will claim exceptional health. But none of that will take the place of eternal life offered by God. We need to remember that in God's overall plan, we are supposed to live forever. The short time in this life is nothing compared to what God has planned for us. So no matter what happens to us in this life, God has a glorious plan for us in the future if we choose his side. Carrie? Yes, coming, coming from Psalm 7120. Thou which hast shown me great and sore troubles shalt quicken me again and shall bring me up again from the depths of the earth. That's the King James Version. Okay, bring me up from the depths of the earth. That's uh, obviously some reference to resurrection, right? David recognized that God had been his salvation, the one who cared for him at every step in his life, from the time in his mother's womb all the way to death. Gordon? From the Bible Study Guide, the expression, quote, from the depths of the earth, end quote, could be understood literally as an allusion to the future physical resurrection of the psalmist. But the context seems to favor a metaphorical description of David's condition of deep depression, as if the earth were swallowing him. Then compare Psalm 88.6 and Psalm 131. So we could say that, quote, it is primarily figurative speech but also hints at a physical resurrection, close quote. Okay. The Bible Study Guide is quoting Andrew's Study Bible. We have all experienced very difficult times, ever falling uh, into depression, even falling into depression or discouragement. We need to remember that God is still beside us and ready to take our hand. We need to learn to trust him. Consider how Jesus himself achieved his final victory. This is really, really key passage here and uh, about faith. Well, dying on the cross, amid the awful darkness, 
apparently forsaken by, of God, Christ had drained the last dregs in the cup of human all. In those dreadful hours, he had relied upon the evidence of his father's acceptance heretofore given him. Now let's, let's notice that very carefully. At that point in time, it's very clear he could not feel the Father's presence. He couldn't pray to him. He couldn't get any answers for him. It looked like the whole world was collapsing on him. But he said, that doesn't matter. I know my Father. From my previous experiences with Father, I know him. I know he's reliable. So that, what do we call that kind of response? Faith. Go ahead. I did, did this, did the, did you know this in the Garden of Gethsemane? Yes. Perhaps, and that really, truly when it started, and he was sweating blood. Yeah. And it was all the way through to the cross. Yeah. That must have been a very lonely walk. Yes. Natural <sighs> hours, uh, okay. He, he was acquainted with the character of his father. He understood his justice his mercy and his great love. By faith he rested in him whom it had never, ever, ever. been his, ever been his joy to obey. And as in submission to his, his committed himself to God, the sense of the loss of his father's favor was withdrawn. By faith, Christ was victor. By what, how, how, how was he victorious? By faith. And faith is based on what? He trusted what he had learned about his father. And he said, no matter what the Satan does to me, Satan was trying to get him to believe, you know, if you, if you go through this, you're going to die and you're never going to be, you're never going to see your father again. There's no resurrection. Whatever Satan said, Christ said, no, I know my father. And that was his faith. And he... Isn't that the only way uh, for a Christian to live? Yep. Desire of Ages, 756, paragraph 3. So what did Isaiah tell us about the future? What contrast did he suggest between those who will perish and those who receive eternal life? Reading Isaiah 26, verses 14 and 19. Now they are dead and will not live again. Their ghosts will not rise. That's an expression we're all talking about the spirit. For you have punished them and destroyed them. No one, will, no one remembers them anymore. Those of our people who have died will live again. Their bodies will come back to life. All those sleeping in their graves will wake up and sing for joy as the sparkling dew refreshes the earth. So the Lord will revive those who have long been dead. Malachi reflects these ideas from Isaiah. Jim? Malachi chapter 4, verse 1. The Lord Almighty says, the day is coming when all proud and evil people will burn like straw. On that day, they will burn up and there will be nothing left of them from the Good News Bible. We human beings living on this earth see things in a very egocentric way. All we know about is this life. All we know about is what's around us. But God asks us to read his word and to look up to see what he has planned for us. In actual fact, our lives on this earth are very brief. Isaiah talks about that. Carrie? Uh, verses 40, uh, chapter 40, verses 6 through 8. A voice cries out, proclaim a message. What message shall I proclaim, I ask? Proclaim that all human beings are like grass. They last no longer than wildflowers. Grass withers and flowers fade. When the Lord sends the wind blowing over them, people are no more enduring than grass. Yes, grass withers and flowers fade, but the word of our God endures forever. That's from the Good News Bible. Isaiah 56 is another place, it's in one passage in which God said that Jews and Gentiles alike were his people. Foreigners were welcome to his temp temple, to his house of prayer, which was for who? All, na All nations. Too bad the mm. Jews didn't remember that. Or yes. Pay attention to that, huh? As we have suggested already, it is clear from Scripture that the righteous will be raised to life and ascend to heaven at the second coming of Jesus Christ. 
Revelation 20 makes it clear that the wicked will rise at the third coming when God comes down with the New Jerusalem. But they will survive only long enough to recognize the mistakes they made and why they are outside the New Jerusalem, the city, and not inside. Then they will perish forever. Revelation 21.8 But cowards, traitors, perverts, murderers, the immoral, those who project who practice magic, those who worship idols, and all liars. The place for them is a lake burning with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Good News Bible. Yeah, by contrast, for the righteous we have these words. Isaiah 25, 8, He will swallow up death in victory, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all their faces. And the, rebuke, and the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off all the earth. The Lord hath spoken it. And you recognize the King James language there. Mm -hmm. While the wicked will perish, and all memory of them probably as well, the truth about the plan of the salvation will be a safeguard. The death of Christ upon the cross made sure the destruction of him who has the power of death, who was the originator of sin. When Satan is destroyed, there will be none to tempt to evil. The atonement will never need to be repeated, and there will be no danger of another rebellion in the universe of God. That which alone can effectually restrain from sin in this world of darkness will prevent sin in heaven. The significance of the death of Christ will be seen by saints and angels. The angels ascribe honor and glory to Christ, for even they are not secure except by looking to the sufferings of the Son of God. Now, basically, that's talking about the whole conflict of the, the plan of, I mean, the great controversy. It is through the efficacy of the cross that the angels of heaven are guarded from apostasy. Without the cross, it would be no more secure against evil than were the angels before the fall of Satan. Angelic perfection failed in heaven. Human perfection failed in Eden, a paradise of bliss. All who wish for security in earth or heaven must look to the Lamb of God. The plan of salvation, making manifest the justice and love of God, provides an eternal safeguard. What does that mean? How long is it going to last? Eternal. An eternal safeguard against defection in unfallen worlds, as well as among those who shall be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. If anybody is tempted to rebel against God, they would say, have a look at what happened the last time somebody did that. There are many who will be lost because they depend on legal religion or mere repentance for sin. But repentance for sin alone cannot work the salvation of any soul. Man cannot be saved by his own works. Without Christ, it is impossible for him to render a perfect obedience to the law of God, and heaven can never be gained by an imperfect obedience. For this would place all heaven in jeopardy and make possible a second rebellion. Wow. Why don't we hear this from the Adventist pulpits from time to time? This is beautiful, absolutely yeah. beautiful to put together. Signs of the Times, December 30, 1889, right after the 1888 General Conference. Mm -hmm. Has this ever never been put in a book form? Not as far as I know. Well, the Bible commentary. Some, I'm sorry. Some portions. Some portions are in the Bible commentary. Uh, Our high calling and mm. uh, yeah, but not the whole thing. Not the whole thing. Yeah. The records of the progress and results of the great controversy will be preserved as an eternal safeguard against sin. In fact, it will be our study for the rest of eternity. It will be a museum. Yeah. A museum for us to learn, just yeah. like. There are supposed museums about the Holocaust, of course. Yeah. It hasn't kept people from doing, the same, thing doing the same thing to other people. While the Sadducees denied any resurrection from the dead, Acts 23, 8, clearly Martha knew that her brother would rise to life on the last day, John 11, 24. Why do you think the Sadducees took that position? You're supposed to answer all the questions mm -hmm. here. Some have speculated that it's, well, we want to enjoy, and if we don't have to face a, 
uh, you know, face judgment, you know, if it's all just here and now, why? then, you know, we can do what we want now. Why do you think we have the ideas of evolution and all that kind of stuff? Because people don't want to face the idea that one day God will come back and they will face the judge. That's the whole point. If you follow the, if you trace the story, that is, that is what they were trying to get rid of. And how much, how many people in our world today buy that stuff? Of course, he is a very loving judge. That's but a, but that's a false, a judge. false presupposition, is it not? Because Jesus says, I judge no one. Yeah. It's the words I have already spoken. And way back, that's going to be your judge. Uh, basically, we end up, heaven is self-selected. Okay. Daniel 12, 1 to 4, the angel wearing linen clothes said, at that time, the great angel Michael, who guards your people, will appear. Then there will be a time of troubles, the worst since nations first came into existence. And when's that going to happen? When I say going to happen, what am I saying? Second coming. It's still future, right? Right. Wow. Okay. Uh, when that time comes, all the people of your nation whose names are written in God's book will be saved. Many of those who have already died will live again. Some will enjoy eternal life and some will suffer eternal disgrace. The wise leaders will shine with all the brightness of the sky and those who have taught many people to do what is right will shine like the stars forever. He said to me, now Daniel, close that book and put a seal in it until the end of the world. So there's another indication that we're talking about the end of time, right? Meanwhile, many people waste their efforts trying to understand what is happening. That's straight from the scriptures. Uh, kindly yeah. make a statement on that one, make a comment. So basically what that is saying, in my opinion, is they don't understand the great controversy. They will not understand the great controversy. And so they don't understand the conflict between God and Satan about the character of God and the government of God and why Satan is challenged. They don't know why it matters. Yeah. They don't know why they understanding the character. We've said many, many times before, it is a law of human nature that you become like the person or thing that you worship or admire. Mm -hmm. And you give many examples about a person that tattoos themselves or pierces themselves or whatever. Yeah. You know, you like have an arbitrary, vengeful, unforgiving, exacting, severe, tyrannical, and despotic God, and you admire that. Yeah. Why would you not want to uh, copy emulate it? it? <laughs> I believe that Milton in Paradise Lost talked about good versus evil. <clears throat> well, it's much more than good versus right. evil. It's mm -hmm. over the character, what God is like. Yeah. And people who come to the table with presupposition. Yeah. That's what's happening all over the Protestant church, yeah. really. They've exactly. made up their mind, thou shalt not surely die. And they took it for themselves. Mm -hmm. and, uh, well, and that's why Satan's life. hell, yes, hell is such a precious doctrine. Yeah, there you are. Because uh, if you don't die and God's and a certain level of logic, well, God's going to give blessings to the good dudes. What's he going to do to the bad ones? So then you got uh, got a hell, to, got to punish those bad ones. And they make it even worse than any p p part of life now. Well, and hell is a good motivator to Bring in your money and that's the right. fire insurance premiums. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> like Isaiah, Daniel clearly you can build churches with that money. Yes. <laughs> very well, famous you can make institutions. Cathedrals. Large cathedrals. Uh, retirement benefits and uh, uh, <laughs> like Isaiah, Daniel clearly, clearly wrote of a resurrection, both of the righteous and the unrighteous. It is possible that this refers to the general resurrections we know about, which will occur at the second coming and at the third coming. It is also possible that this is talking about a special resurrection of certain people, some faithful and some wicked, who will rise just before Christ's second coming. Carrie, I think that's yours. Okay. Graves are opened, and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. That's from Daniel 12, 2. Okay, let me interrupt for a second. <clears throat> so this resurrection, there's both the good, there's some good people and some evil people all arising at the same time. That's why it doesn't seem to be the general resurrections, right? Go ahead. 
All who have died in the faith of the third angel's message come forth from the tomb glorified to hear God's covenant of peace with those who have kept his law. They also which pierced him, Revelation 1.7, those that mocked and derided Christ's dying agonies and the most violent opposers of his truth and his people are raised to behold him in his glory and to see the honor placed upon the loyal and obedient. That's from the Great Controversy, page 637, paragraph 1. There's one time in the history of our world so far when a fairly large group of formerly dead people were raised to life. Do you know when that was? Uh, when Christ rose from the connection grave. with the death and, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So why don't we have the testimonies of the people who rose at Christ's resurrection? Wouldn't that be helpful? I mean, think of what they could tell us about the Old Testament. If we could only video that. Yes. Indeed. That would be so helpful in our understanding of the relationship of the Old Testament to the New and, of course, the truth about death. From the Bible Study Guide. You ready for that? Mm -hmm. From the Bible Study Guide. Modern, modern science teaches that all matter is composed of atoms, themselves made up of two smaller particles, quarks and leptons, which are believed to be the building blocks of all physical reality. If then, at the core of the physical world is quarks and leptons, couldn't the, the God who not only created and sustains that world also just reconfigure the quarks and leptons when, he, when the time comes to resurrect us? Mocking the resurrection, atheist Bertrand Russell asked what happens to those whom cannibals ate because their bodies are now part of the cannibals. And so who gets what in the resurrection? <clears throat> but suppose the Lord simply grabs quarks and leptons and the ultimate building blocks of existence from wherever, and based on the information that he possesses about each one of us, reconstructs us from those quarks and leptons on up. He doesn't need our original ones, any will do. Or in fact, he could just speak new quarks and leptons into existence and go from there. However, he does it. The God who created the universe can recreate us, which he promises to do at the resurrection of the dead. <coughs> In the Bible study guide for Friday, October 21. Okay, Charles. Um, the life giver, the life giver will call up his purchased position in the first resurrection and until that triumphant honor, when hour. the hour, when the last trump shall sound and the vast army shall come forth to eternal victory, every sleeping saint will be kept in safely and will be guarded as a precious jewel who is known to God by name, by the power of the Savior that dwelt in the in them while living um, and because they were partakers of the divine nature they are brought forth from the dead mm -hmm. later 65 a 1894 Ellen White there in this earth made new every power this is from Ellen White every power will be developed every capability increased the grandest enterprises will be carried forward the loftiest aspirations will be reached the highest ambitions realized, and still there will appear new heights to surmount. Now that's a contradiction. You can't go to the highest and then there's still more. But she, she you know, she ran out of language to use. More hyperbole, huh? Yeah. Uh, new one. Higher than the highest human thoughts right. can reach. Yes. New wonders to admire, new truths to comprehend, fresh objects of study and to call forth the powers of body and mind and soul from Prophet and Kings 73, 731, paragraph one. Almost every day we see results from the Hubble telescope and the new Webb telescope suggesting that there are literally billions, maybe trillions of galaxies and worlds all created by God. Many of them probably have living creatures on them. There should, be not, there should not be any problem with our understanding of that God can create human beings. 
the Old Testament writers clearly believed in a resurrection. They thought that this would happen at the Messiah's first coming. As we have seen, the words of Job trying to respond to the terrible accusations of his so-called friends are one of the most powerful statements about the future resurrection and life with God. Job called the Redeemer, his kinsman, Redeemer, Defender, Vindicator, Protector, as a Hebrew word, can be various, tra variously translated. And there are the words of Job 19, 25 to 7, which we've already read. Unfortunately, people know and quote usually only verse 25, but what continues is equally crucial. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh, flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes. I am not another. How my heart yearns within me. Um, that's from uh, those same verses, NIV. Notice the personal words of Job's solemn declaration. My, I, myself, my own. He firmly believes in his heart that in his flesh with his own eyes, he will see God even though he will die and his flesh will be destroyed. This personal assurance of a future resurrection, resurrection day cannot be expressed in a better and more emphatic way from our Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide. Now, we would like to say uh, we're trying to make these study guides more interactive. We'd like to encourage you to get a copy of it. Go to our website. That's www.theox. That's t h e o x dot o r g, and you can find all this material that we're using here, and use some of these questions in your own Sabbath school class. Some might still have a question about the word Sheol. The Bible is very clear that the Hebrew word means the grave. Therefore, my heart is glad, my tongue rejoices, my body also will rest secure, because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, that is, Sheol, and so forth. And there's a continues on there. Um, I'm going to drop down. Nowhere in the Bible is Sheol described as a shadowy underworld where the dead live or where human souls or spirits continue their existence. The word Sheol, word Sheol is the designation for the grave, the place of the dead. And uh, we're going to leave the rest of that material for you to explore on your own. Thank you for joining us. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, what a privilege it is to come and talk about these very important issues with friends who understand you as we do, we hope. We ask that all those who listen in will be blessed as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank mm -hmm. you.